Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, world class percussionist Taku Hirano. And now, Rich Redman. All right, what is up, rock and rollers, folks out in podcast land? Yep, it's that time again, another exciting episode of the Rich Redmond Show. I'm Rich Redmond, your host, coming from Nashville today and sunny Los Angeles, two of the last music cities, two of the best music cities. And uh, I am really excited about uh, today's guest. We have a lot of mutual friends. For I would say for the last at least 25 years, one of the top percussionists on this planet Let's just look at some of these folks that this gentleman has played with. We're talking Fleetwood Mac, Whitney Houston, Bette Midler, Lionel Richie, Isaac Hayes, John Mayer, Usher, Shakira, Mary J. Blush. The list goes on and on. Film scores, always touring, always recording. Our new friend, Taku Hirano. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's finally, it's so great to finally meet you, Rich. Well, it, likewise. And it's so funny because I feel like in today's world, we can kind of like keep track of each other on social media. It's like, oh yeah, yeah, he's in Japan today. Oh, he's in Saskatchewan today. And and it's funny, you can kind of keep tabs on all your friends. And but then sometimes you realize, wow, six years have gone by. I haven't seen this person in the flesh. Definitely. Especially with COVID now, you realize, oh, I definitely haven't seen people in at least two years. You know? I know. Uh, it is I don't know about you. I hate to to beat it into the ground, but for a social butterfly like me, I mean, I this thing is is really affected my life. I miss people. I want to hug people. I want to kiss people. It's been so hard. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. You know, I mean, my parents live in Japan. I haven't seen it'll be three years almost. You know, before I'll see them again. I, I, at wow. this point, I don't even know when I'm going to see them again. But, but you know, come come. Uh, mid mid year this year it'll have been three years you know so, God. yeah it's tough. yeah i remember it's tough. going almost the the whole first year you know pre-vax and going like when am i going to see my parents and then um you know i'm sure you experienced the same thing of having to do recording sessions in a variety of cities and wearing the shield and the two masks and the gloves and i'm just like ah, i don't know what's going to happen here are we going to have toilet paper are we going to have to eat each other um, but you know, music yeah. calls and, and you're like, Oh, a session. Yeah. I'll be there. Uh, you know, most definitely actually for me, most of my session work, believe it or not, has been all remote. So I've just been recording myself and I don't think I'm trying to remember if I, I have yet to do a recording session in an actual, nah, that's not true. I've done a couple, but, uh, post being vaccinated, you know, but right. definitely like for the first year and a half, it was all at home. Yeah. You know, so you have you a, a, a nice spread at the house while mic'd up with instruments and like, it seems like it's an expectation. Yeah. You know, every, everybody definitely. in New York, LA and Nashville has this thing going, you know? Yeah, no, definitely. You know, it's like being a percussionist, I don't necessarily have to have a, a kit set up because literally every song, even if it's the same artist, it completely set, it, the setup completely changes. So sure. I'm just kind of ready to go with, with my DAW and mics up and ready, but yeah. yeah. And then I just kind of, if it's like a hone or a djembe session or just shakers and tambourines, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go. But uh, it's not like having a drum set, a traditional drum set set up, you know, in, in, in a studio, all mic'd right. up and ready. So, yeah. So it makes well, it a I little was, bit easier for me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Cause you know, even just me, like I, I'm a drummer first percussionist second, you know, like yourself, I studied classical percussion and ethnic percussion. And then I tell all the kids like, look at you have got to at least have a grasp on how to do a shaker maraca pop tambourine, pop bongo, conga, djembe, cajon, overdub in like a, for a pop sensibility because at A, you're going to make twice the amount of money and two, it's just so fun because you get to think ahead and layer your own parts. Most definitely. Most you know? definitely, yeah. I've actually had, I was, I've been working with Leanne Rhymes for the last, well, I guess now two years on, on two of her albums. And that's exactly what we did. Like some, some of the stuff was literally her singing a scratch track while hitting a table. And then it was like, I would build all these multi-layer percussion tracks and send them back. And then she puts her stuff on it. And we kind of bounce back and forth between me and her producer. 
And it's just so fun. Again, just thinking ahead and going, okay, I want to, I want to layer these. And, and especially if it's percussion only that I'm, I'm specifically choosing instruments that would emulate like a kick in a snare, if it's a cajon or djembe or. Right. That kind of so thing. I want to yeah. get into like, as I was doing my research, I was looking at all these Google images, all the tours you've been on over the years. And here's your Fleetwood Mac setup. Here's your Stevie Nicks. It's almost like sometimes you have a rack and, and there's pads everywhere. And, yeah. I do remember about like in my garage, I've got like two huge like LP and Toka like live percussionist tables where you can set all your stuff and you can hang stuff. And it's just kind of sitting out there collecting dust because <laughs> Nashville is not really like a live percussion town. There's some, a lot of overdub going on, but I know as soon as I sell those tables, I'm going to need them. It's always the case, right? <laughs> like you want to get rid of your rototoms. And then as soon yeah. as you get rid of your rototoms, you're like, hey, we're doing a missing persons cover band. <laughs> you know, and then you don't have your road. It's true. It's true. Yeah. But until like, yeah. so I was looking at all the various setups, what informs um, your setup? Like you start with a basic thing, like first day of rehearsal, and then you have to start choreographing the rig because I'm assuming if, if I was in the same position, you would have to figure out over the course of this 90 minute show. Okay. My congas and my bongos are home base. And then I've got to be able to get to everything and make the transition from song to song smoothly. Is that kind of what determines your setup? Most definitely. And then over the years, um, I kind of, my home base now is, yes, congas front and center. I don't play that much bongos within a, the span of a show. So they're not, a lot of percussions have bongos directly in front of their congas. Right. So they can kind of do, but I'm like, I don't really use them. I hit a tambourine, a mounted tambourine all the time. So my mounted tambourine is in front of my congas. That way I have to play hit back beats, no matter what my sticking is, left hand or right hand. Oh, that's really smart. Um, and then, um, so like bongos are kind of off to the side. And then it just comes down to like the ergonomics. I'm right-handed. So I tend to shake things with my right hand. So my Me too. table will yeah. All my handheld stuff is to my right. So my yeah. so home base is three congas, percussion table to the right, bongos kind of off to the side to my left. And then to my left is usually timbales or whatever else I may possibly need. If I'm doing a pop pop gig, there may not be any need for timbales. So then all of a sudden like an octopad or something's going to be on my left or, or whatever. And I'm right. a little more nimble with what's on my left side. And I tend to read music on my left. So um because oftentimes, for whatever reason, oftentimes I'm situated stage right. So a lot of times the drummer is to my left. So I can actually read music and see the drummer be on the, be on the music stand or be on the monitor. Oh, so that's really smart. So that's yeah, if you're... Home... yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of my home base walking in the door to a rehearsal um, for the first time with an artist I never worked with or for like, a, you know, a TV house band for like if we're the house band for the Grammy Awards or something like that. Yeah, so I'll walk into rehearsals that with that template set up, and then then I'll start tweaking stuff as, as I need to for for that particular show. Because so, you might want to be visual. Like sometimes you have symbols way up high, or you'll have a variety of individual trigger pads, and then on some yep. some things you'll have an SPDSX and an Octopad and a Korg Wave Drum. So it's yep. is that because like mm -hmm. oh I use this Korg Wave Drum on one song, but I love the sound on it. So it's going to be there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And then like, let's say the core wave drum, I only use it on one song, but only my right hand's playing it because I have to play something else or only my left hand's playing it because I have to play a shaker at the same time yeah. or on yeah. my right hand's playing it because I'm playing something with the bongos to my left. So it's like, then I, then I'll figure out where each, each item needs to be kind of yeah. like, as far as all the ancillary stuff. And as far as symbol height, what tends to happen a lot, especially on some of my bigger rigs where I have, a multitude of symbols, then they'll, they're actually kind of quite high so that I have a full sight line under the symbols right. 360 around. So I could see the drummer and the musical director and get a pan of the stage. So they don't, they aren't necessarily at the optimal height for that. I would love playing wise. If I were to set one up just for a recording session, but for live, like I'll have them a little bit higher than that, just so I could see under them. Yeah. And so I love, I love the choreography of all of it. Cause it takes me back to like, when I was studying classical percussion, you might have to do what they call a multi-percussion piece that's, that has a 20th century vibe where it's like shifting meters and everything, but there's all these different instruments. And then you have all your mallets and different striking things that you have to plan exactly when you're going to set them down, when you're going to pick them up. And, oh, you don't necessarily want it to be noisy when you make the switch. So then you have to have all the 
carpet and padding on the music stands and the tables like that yeah. stuff really like pays off i think like drummers don't necessarily have to drum set players don't necessarily have to think of it as much but even just the coordination thing is so impressive because say you're doing your shaker in your right hand playing a mounted cowbell with your right foot and then you're playing congas with the left hand and then fitting in a a, a backbeat on beat four yeah. that is coordination in the extreme at the extreme level yeah definitely definitely and then so with with the the phrase home base i have home based grooves that i've kind of developed over the years so that whatever i'm shaking i feel very comfortable that i can play other things you know with, with my left hand it's no different than just playing eighth notes on a hi-hat you're not really thinking about eighth notes so i'm not really thinking about sh shaker or tambourine so i'm freed up to do all the comping or whatever with my yeah. other hand on whatever instruments yeah and so. yeah and then your left hand i guess your tone production like I'm a right-handed player. So the first thing I ever learned to do was to play a cup slap with the right hand, right? You're just like, oh, I got this and the back nails. But then to do it <laughs> unmuted with your left hand and play the yeah. open song and the unmuted slap while doing the, sh it's all very impressive, yeah. man. That's, that, that's the, separates yeah. the men from the boys there. <laughs> it's time, time spent practicing. Definitely. Yeah. So, well, well, well <laughs> yeah. and what does that look like? Um, Cause I know you grew up in several cities and yep. they were all like major metropolitan areas where you had the the exposure to great musicians and great teachers. So if you wanted to take us back a little bit. Uh, actually, no, mo the, most of my time was spent in a small town in Fresno, California. Oh, Fresno. Okay. Uh, yeah. So my, my father uh, is in the was in the textiles business and we were transferred from Japan to Fresno just because Fresno was kind of this, the central point within California of kind of the, the, the agriculture and cotton so he it would be between stockton fresno and bakersfield so that's right. why we, we were transferred there um not a whole lot to do in fresno even still to this day but honestly like it was fantastic because i ended up having this amazing percussion teacher and so i practiced a lot yeah. <laughs> so yeah. so starting um at age nine i was doing all the city county honor bands and this and that and then eventually like all state orchestra and just just the very traditional kind of school yeah school band solo and ensemble competitions and all that all kind of that stuff. stuff so who was your first yep. teacher let's yep. give them some props here oh let's yeah her, her name is brenda brenda myers and she's uh still teaching to this day in fresno and and she's out of the school district now and she actually has her own like um uh percussion ensembles geared towards kids so wow she's, she's made a huge mark kind of in the percussion world uh starting them really young and early so yeah well that's she's got the first first wave she's got to be proud of you yeah i think so she's come to multiple fleetwood mac shows i was just actually on tour um with another artist uh november and december uh and so we played a show in bakersfield she actually drove down a couple hours just to see that show that's so, awesome was, yeah yeah so i'm really happy that we keep in touch yeah 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 um i um i think it was a couple years ago it had to be 2018 or 2019 we did an iheart festival at the mgm and it was we played panic at the disco played and you guys played and i saw your rig backstage and i was like oh taco's oh. here today and I, I went and looked at all your stuff and um it was just kind of like you know spying on it so just checking out yeah. checking out the gear yeah no that was um yeah that was we were still in rehearsals with fleetwood mac and so that was kind of that incarnation of fleetwood mac's first show we were we literally like flew and trucked everything from la to vegas played iheart came back and then resumed rehearsals for like another ah, few weeks okay. before we started to kick off the now day. the most yeah. exciting yeah. thing i saw that day was yeah after your show mick came off the drums and someone who could have been the, the stage manager put a cape on him. Oh, like, that's his, yeah, that's, that's his, uh, assistant. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's his, is that his thing? It's like, like, I was like, this is amazing. He's a superhero. <laughs> you know, it's really funny because he comes off stage drenched. And so like, he's like, I don't want to catch the cold. So like he is soaked when he that walks. That is smart. Stage. Does he not have fans? The funny have... thing is actually, he actually has space heaters blowing up his back while he's playing. What is that all about? Uh, staying warm, keeping his muscles loose. Wow. So he actually stays so he he's constantly hydrating but constantly having space like i don't know maybe two two little ceramic space heaters behind him blowing warm air at him that blows 
my mind because um you know for probably i have like tornado fans <laughs> keeping me cool on stage but I mean, my <laughs> I, I my drum tech invented well i think a lot of guys do it but i have an air conditioning unit back there so i've got two oh, fans wow. that are blowing air conditioning so it's like 60 degrees around my drum set just wow. to help me because um i we do a lot of like you know like you guys over the years i'm sure you've experienced it where you're playing big summer outdoor festivals and i got kind of like a sensitive stomach and you're just like this is hot man and then you, your stomach starts yeah. like i need some cool air back here man you know yeah yeah no he um i can't say that he the space feeders are on like for an entire show but they're in his rig in his touring rig he has them so that's so, incredible yeah. and, then we'll, and we'll the gong and, everyone's always saying hey man you need a gong. everyone's the big joke for drummers and percussionists where's the gong and i'm like yeah <laughs> maybe one year yeah just the last note like zeppelin <laughs> And he actually starts the first song traditionally on the Fleetwood Mac shows is a song called The Chain. And he does use the gong kind of in the intro of that song. And then when he does his big uh, drum solo slash drum and percussion duet, he's smacking the gong somewhere in there as well. So he actually does so, use it. <laughs> now, in the yeah. drum and percussion duet, is this a thing you guys have worked out compositionally or is there room for change? Uh, is, is there a form and you could change within that? or? Um. Well, by the end of a year and a half tour, there's definitely a form. But um, when it starts out, like, I just kind of get the idea, like, I, we sit down, definitely, and it's like, see what he wants to do. And, you know, so this this past tour, it was, you know, he starts out working the crowd, playing a drum solo. And then whenever he he has a headset mic, he's yelling at the crowd, doing the call and response while he's drumming. And then, yeah, I just wait for him and then he screams my name and I just start playing, you know, and, and it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a little so, bit of like, he's playing an underlying Tom groove. He yells my name. I come up, I, you know, blaze some chops and do a conga solo. And then I ease back down. Then we kind of groove for a while and we're just watching each other and stuff like that. And then there's a couple yeah. little breaks or little things he hits when I know what he's going to do. The Rich Redmond show will be right back. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one -on -one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. You know, one of the um, the first things that really piqued my ear and got me into percussion, because um, we're similar age, um, was Grover Washington Jr.'s Just the Two of Us. So you got Gad on drums, and then Ralph McDonald comes in at the end with all the mounted uh, go-go's and cowbells and everything. And the track just explodes. It's like the fourth chorus or something. It's like, yep. and I'm like, and it's like, <laughs> I mean, and then to yeah. top it off, I don't know if you ever got to, did you ever get to know Ralph? He wrote the song. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, definitely. I, I, I've met him before several times just being in New York. Uh, when I first got the Bette Midler gig, you know, half the band were New Yorkers. So like, after rehearsal, we go out and, and I got to see Ralph play a couple times, you know, just oh. locally. You know, and then 80 artists, a handheld cowbell, <laughs> you know, 80, 80 artists um, recorded that song. So, I mean, he, oh, yeah. you know, I, I don't think he ever had to work a day in his life if he didn't want to because there's just checks showing up in his mailbox every day. Yeah. Between that and um, was it Killing Me Softly that he wrote also? I think he, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <thanks>. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So, Roberta Flack, Killing Me Softly as well. Yeah. So. Oh my God. So, so that your first teacher is, is still thriving. She's really proud of you. Yep. And then you go on and you're studying with other folks. Did you end up at Cal arts? Did I, is, did I read that somewhere? I did. Yeah, I did. Okay. Kind of a quick chronology. So then I was studying with Brenda. Then my family was transferred to Hong Kong for my dad's business. And so in Hong Kong, I went way deep dive into classical percussion. So I ended up right. studying with a principal timpanist of the Hong Kong Philharmonic nice. with the whole goal of, of getting into Juilliard, either for college or, or, or earlier than college. Um, then for 
that was seventh through 10th grade. And then we moved back to Fresno. So then I resumed studies with Brenda. And by then I was kind of just doing what I was doing. I was getting actually when I moved back, sorry, that that's when I went to a school of the arts in Fresno, which had a salsa band. That's when I first started got, getting into hand percussion, playing Afro-Cuban and, and Afro-Brazilian percussion, in addition to studio recording, in addition to jazz band, jazz combo, in addition to orchestra and, and city county orchestra and all that stuff. And then uh, I got accepted to Berkeley College of Music. And so I went there and that's when I started studying with Giovanni Hidalgo. Oh, wow. Freshman year. Yeah. So nice. Giovanni ended up teaching at Berkeley for the four years I was at Berkeley. He taught for four years. So I just made sure to get as much time with him as possible. So you soaked it up. most of my like Afro-Cuban technique and stuff was, you know, due to all my yeah. time with him. That thing, then, that the yeah. thing, the he heel tip, heel tip, double stroke yeah. roll thing. Blah, 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 yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a and then also I was sitting with Jamie Haddad at Berkeley. So Jamie was the one who was teaching me frame drums and a lot of uh, Indian rhythmic concepts and whatnot. And then uh, after, after I graduated from Berkeley with a bachelor's degree, I moved to LA and I started grad school at CalArts. And that's when I went there to s strictly be like a world perform world music performance graduate nice. student. And that was, and uh, so I was studying with that was uh, Bergamo, right? Yeah. So I was studying and, in Kabbalah with him. And, and, and John, he passed, right? A couple years ago? He, he did pass. Yeah. I can't yeah. remember how long ago now. It was like yeah. four or five years so ago. I, yeah. yeah. And um, so, yeah. So, I, I never finished grad school at Cal Arts because I ended up just touring tours, tours, tours. So, um, but yeah, my time there was fantastic. I did a year there, and it was it was great. It was awesome. Great. Well, every I mean, yeah. it seems like so much in life, you know, comes down to relationships. You do one job for someone, you over prepare, you exceed expectations, you knock it out of the ballpark. Obviously, you're a super likable guy. Um, what was that first gig? that you got professionally where it's like, Oh my God, I, I have kicked the door open here to the music business. This is, this is it. Hmm. I think, I mean, I moved to LA in 96 and I got my first gig two weeks in. Uh, so I actually ended up deferring my first semester at Cal Arts. And that was through a good friend of little John Roberts. We were at Berkeley together. Okay. Um, that was with a R&B artist, Tevin Campbell, who was produced by Quincy Jones. Nice. But fast forward three years after that, it was about the three year mark in LA is when I got the call for Whitney Houston. And that was kind of like the big, big gig. I've been doing lots of smaller tours. I didn't even tour with Isaac Hayes uh, before that. But I think yeah. Whitney was like the first like major world tour where I was, you know, in Europe for four months straight and we we're playing awesome. all over Wembley, all that stuff. So that was when it was kind of like, okay, you know, I, I went. I started out kind of an R&B hip hop and obviously Whitney is R&B and that album at the time was very hip hop because it, it was like Rodney Jerkins, Missy Elliott and all that stuff on the album. But that kind of crossed me over into getting more pop gigs after that. Right. So, yeah. Wow. And then after that, that was, that was, that was when like it, most of my tours ended up just being arena tours after that. Would well, that had to be pretty amazing to play, um, I will always love you with her, with everyone singing yeah. every word to the song. And who was the live drummer at that point? Michael Baker. Okay. Michael Baker. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. What is Michael My Baker? Does he live in Atlanta now maybe? Or um, I, I feel like he's from Minnesota. He's from outside of Minneapolis. He hmm, lived sorry. in Italy for a long time. Wow. Um, and I, I wanted to say he, the last time I saw him was during Fleetwood rehearsals. So that was a few years ago. He dropped by rehearsals to say hi, and he was living in LA again. I'm not sure where he is now, but mm -hmm. but yeah, he's a longtime Whitney Houston drummer. He um, he came on board during the Bodyguard, so I want to say that was around '94 ish. Uh, before that, it was uh, Ricky Lawson was the drummer. oh Ricky, God rest his soul, man. They, yeah. That first Yellow Jackets record is oh yeah gorgeous, you know <laughs> yeah oh yep. my God. So and Baker so was and, with Whitney since then, so and then. So, and it wasn't your mentor and Dugu Chancellor, the session drummer on um, the, the um, I Will Always Love You, wasn't he? I think so. Maybe, I'm not sure. Because I, I think don't. I remember hearing something about ah. Dush, the fill. You know, it was like, I could have played anything there, but I played Dush before the last chorus. It wasn't him. Now I'm trying to remember who it was, but it wasn't him. It was either Ricky Lawson or... John Robinson? I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that still has probably got to be amazing to be playing a, you know, Ray Cooper style tambourine in front of 80,000 people with everyone Definitely. singing every word. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That was that was insane. Just just, you know, hearing that voice playing those songs. I mean, how many times have I probably played in a top 40 band in, in, at Berkeley or whatever or some singer showcase? Yeah. And we perform that song. And then then you're on stage with a sea of lighters lit up, you know, yeah. and and you're hearing that voice sing that song. It's just like, yeah, it's unreal. Yeah. Pre cell phone. And so, and then what is, um, what, um, what was next after that? So you're like, so that's a big calling card. So you unlock the door. Yeah. I'm Whitney's percussionist. I did that for, and so it's got to lead to easily to something else because now people go, well, God, if he's good enough for that, he's good enough for me. It actually turns out like the next gig, I, I pretty much jumped right to it off of Whitney was Lionel Richie. And it okay. turns out at that time, Whitney's tour is all of 99. And at that time, as we were wrapping up the tour, um, the person working, f- basically the liaison for the European promoter, uh, basically the European promotions company was based out of the UK. His liaison rode on the tour bus with us. That promoter also at the time managed Lionel Richie. And so the, the liaison was on the tour bus. We were just having a drink after a show. And he was like, would you consider playing with Lionel Richie? I was like, of course, you know? Yeah. And he goes, okay, all right. And then separately, it turned out that one of my friends was working uh, in LA in Lionel studio as an engineer. And so by the time I got a call for Lionel and I had a meeting with him, he was like, I had to meet you because I got a recommendation from you from my engineer in LA the same week that my manager in London told me about you. And I was like, who is this guy? You know? So um, I met with him and then it was like, okay, welcome to the band, you know? Oh and my God. So, so that was summer of 2000 and, and we went out and did 50 shows with Tina Turner. And so wow. it was her gigantic tour that she did. And um, so, yeah, we did that. And then we're, we did a springboard right off of Tina to do Lionel's awesome tour. And did you yeah. get to know, um, I think uh, Jack Bruno was on drums for Tina Turner back, yeah. back yeah. then. So I'm interviewing Jack on Friday. He's been like a longtime friend. Oh, taught great. at my drum camps. I, yeah. I haven't seen Jack in ages. We will randomly every so often shoot each other like a, an email or text. But honestly, it's probably been more than 10 years since yeah. even that has happened. But, but uh, yeah, it was great. You know, Jack was such a great guy. Yeah. What are some other, uh, what are some other, um, uh, Goosebump moments in your career. Hmm. Wow. Okay. Um, Whitney, for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first time I, uh, I, I kind of was was able to enjoy the moment after I learned the show and everything, and being on on tour in Europe with her. I would say other goosebump moments. Wow. I think uh, maybe not necessarily on tour, but playing. Uh, at the White House for the first state dinner for the Obama Biden administration. Wow! Okay. And I was playing with uh, A.R. Rahman, who uh, had just won the Oscar for his uh, soundtrack and score for *Slumdog Millionaire*. Oh yeah! And I and they called me. It's funny they called me because they asking me if I played taiko drums. I go, I do. You know, I've studied in Japan and and I can, but they didn't know I played any other instrument. But so initially, I started playing with AR, just playing taiko drums, and wow. he had this big hit, Jai Ho, and we did to perform it at the White House. And so that was surreal, just like the whole lead up of, of all the security and everything and getting led into the White House just to perform, and then right after being ushered into a s- small room to meet you know, the wow. president and the first lady and take photos with them. That, that was definitely like, wow, you know, yeah, what, a, what an amazing moment. Um, I don't know. I'm going to keep I mean, thinking Whit- about that. Yeah, Whitney Houston <laughs> and uh, the White House. I mean, that, that's, you know, it's, nope. it's, yeah. um, that's amazing. Uh, yeah. y- you know, it's funny, speaking of like, ex- like extreme, because uh, those are fringe, like ethnomusicology type instruments where it's like, that's not always an expectation, like you own taiko drums, right? <laughs> You're like, <"Wah."> or 
the, what are the, the, the um, those kind of like um, drums from New Mexico that, that are kind of like Indian Sean Pelton oh. will play them sometimes. Not everyone yeah, has those. The Taos drums. The yeah. Taos drums, which I would, yeah. I would love yeah. to have. And then um, to me, it's always, it, it's an incredible sound. It's something that I would love to explore, but it seems like it's a, it's the, you just do that for your entire life. And that's studying tabla. It's like people play, yeah. do you play tabla? I'm like, yeah, it's on my Roland SP. It's on my Roland hand sonic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. I mean, in fact, that's funny. I, when I first got to LA, I met a percussionist and they're like, oh, what are you doing at Cal Arts? I was like, oh, I'm studying tabla. Like I'm, you know, doing my master's degree in world music performance. And they literally said that. They said, oh yeah, I don't need to learn because I have a, I have samples of that. I was like, <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> it's, it's, well, you know, the world that we live in, I mean, it's just like, you know, you studied classical percussion, jazz, drum set, Afro-Cuban, Brazilian, West African, Middle Eastern, Indian, Japanese styles and instruments. I mean, this is a lifelong pursuit. And isn't the challenge, um, you know, you're trying to maintain a level across all those instruments while touring and recording and, and, and just the touring itself is so taxing, you know, eating yeah. right, trying to get your workout in. And I can't even imagine touring internationally right now. I mean, no. wow. Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Uh, I, I like to say even like warming up and trying to get some practice in like before or after sound check, I call it damage control. It's just really like making sure that things are still there in my hands. Right. Know? And just having a high enough baseline where like I can hit every clean slap with my left hand or, so, you know, something like that kind of stuff where I'm just like my baseline is at a, at a high level. Yeah, you know, so no matter how tired I am, or sleep deprived, or if I have food poisoning or whatever, that that I'm operating at that baseline. So I do call it damage control. I just kind of go through my little list of like warm ups and whatnot. You know? Yeah, so I'm not necessarily like you know making leaps and bounds and and doing working on new things. It's really just kind of like okay, I got ten minutes after sound check before the lighting crew has to get on stage and talk with our walkie talkies where I can make a little noise and I just kind of go to task and just make sure everything's there for sure. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Remind, remind me of your companies is Minel, Minel, right? Is that right? Minel. Yep. Yeah. Minel nice. percussion. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been with them? Yeah. Been with them since 08. So that's okay. a good, good stretch. Yeah. And in fact, going back to percussion tables, I actually, um, I have this like custom made gigantic percussion table in my, in my personal touring rig. And I designed kind of a smaller version of one. Uh, it's called the Ergo table, E-R-G-O for Minel. And it's basically an arced percussion table and the inner edge is padded as well. So you could set down instruments on the edge or sticks on the edge without any contact noise. So oh, that's, that that's cool. Oh, yeah. So product uh, design. design. So you got a little bit into the product design. Yeah. That's cool. Yes, yes. So I did that for them. And I have a signature uh, accessory timbali I call the hand bali, and half of the rim is recessed like a bongo so that I could do quick timbali fills just with my hands as opposed to having to pick up sticks. Yeah, I saw that. you do that um, mm -hmm. at a Modern Drummer Festival. Yep. Remind me of the drummer. I'm having a, a senior uh, moment. Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, Trevor. So Trev, Trev's yeah. coming on the show. Trev's Because we store oh, cool. our stuff over at Angel City. I keep some drums in LA. Just, you know, build it, they will come. You know, that's my thing. Yeah. You know, it's like if the call comes and you don't have drums, you know, I don't want to be yeah. that guy. But um, <laughs> so was that yeah. was that that instrument? Yeah, because exactly. it spoke exactly so it well. It really spoke. Yeah. Yep. So yeah, so those are the two kind of items that I, I created that are still in the Minel catalog. Um, I did have like a, a limited edition run of drums, um, custom, not custom, signature drums as well, and so yeah. So yeah, it's been a good good collaboration with Minel. I, I That's awesome. And they, I believe, um, the headquarters is right here in Nashville. Have you been to Nashville? The, isn't it? Aren't they in Nashville? They're in Nashville. The U Minel USA is in Nashville. The, the, the headquarter headquarters is in Germany. Oh, that's but, right. Um, yeah. 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 So I have, I have a great uh, rapport with, with Chris Brewer, who's in charge of artist relations. Chris Brewer. I, I remember meeting him like uh, like the first year he moved to Nashville. And I'm so happy he got that great job. He's had it forever. Yeah. 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 That is so so it's been good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then what is, um, you know, cause if you're, I'm looking at these, this list, all different types of genres. Um, 
was everybody relatively easy to work with? You don't have to name names, but is there a, <laughs> more often than not, are they easy to work with? Or occasionally you get the people that are just a handful, right? But but I would assume that the that the brunt of complaints would go to the drummer because the drummer is more in charge. Like I'm loud, I'm setting the time, <laughs> and you're trying to fit in with that, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, as far as easy to work with in terms of artists, I've I've been knock on wood. I've had everyone I've worked with has been really cool. You know, that's a lot of names. Um, that's incredible. Yeah, no, everyone's been really cool. I mean, some artists, um, I just, I have had very little interaction with. Obviously, yeah. artists I've toured with, I've had a lot of interaction with. But, you know, but if you get like a mega star like Beyonce, you know, and I'm playing behind her for some TV special, like I don't interact with her. I'm interacting with with her people, you know, yeah. whether it's her, her kind of day-to-day -day musical directors coming because she's performing on an award show. And so they, that person talks to the house bands um, musical director and we kind of, you know, and, I, and they may come to me and say, this is what she wants, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, in those situations, they're very nice, but like, I don't really have any super interaction with them other than hello. Hi, how are you doing? Shake your hand. Yeah. About it. Sometimes like the yeah. bigger they are, there's like a chain of command of all the people that she talks to this guy, this guy talks to this, and it's like, yeah. <laughs> It trickles yeah. all the way no, down. No, definitely. No, definitely. So when I walk into situations like that, I don't, I don't expect much. But then there's like some other stars and, and you know, well-known artists that are like super cool. I mean, and affable and just like friendly. Like Ed Sheeran. It was actually in a rehearsal for a TV special, and we were performing with Beyonce and Ed Sheeran performing together. And when Beyonce walked into the room, obviously all eyes were on her, it was super fuss. And I was just kind of like, okay, let me just kind of get out of the way because she ended up having to do work with the background singers directly in front of me. And they had her whole social media team. I was like, let me just get out of the way, you know, while coffee time. Out. So I just go, yeah. went to get coffee. And Ed Sheeran walks up and he's like, hey, how you doing? You know, and then when Ed Sheeran and I just had this lovely conversation, I was just like, you know, talking to him about his, his meteoric rise because that was the, his first Grammys uh, at the time. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, how's the ride? And, oh man, I've just been, you know, trying to, uh, it's all icing on the cake. I just wanted a break in the UK, you know? So this is, I'm just enjoying the ride. And then, then, and then he goes, how's your ride been? You know, tell me about you. And That's so we nice. sat and had coffee. Yeah. <laughs> you want to know about my career? I was just like, oh, okay. You know, so there's definitely really cool artists like that too. So absolutely. Not that Beyonce is not cool, but it was just like, you know, it was just, it was the juxtaposition between the machine and then him just like walking in the door and, in a flannel shirt, just walking around and nobody talking to him and you know, just kind of like <laughs> hanging out with the, yeah. with the band. Totally. So, yeah. Um, what's, what, uh, what's next after, um, is, is Fleetwood Mac is home base right now? Um, Fleetwood Mac is always home base, but they don't, you know, they go on tour every few years. So in between it just, it is definitely whatever pops up. And over the last couple of years since COVID, that has been Leanne Rhymes as far as studio stuff and, and the occasional TV special with her. Um, I released an album in October, October uh, on Rope New York. Road. Blue York, which is yeah. more of a jazz, funk, jazz fusion. Project. Live. It sounds great. Yeah. I loved it. I really did. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, I went out on tour. I got called by this uh, ukulele virtuoso, Jake Shimabukuro, and he was interested in having me just play Cajon on this little stripped down show, this, this end of year tour that he did. So we went out for about six, seven weeks. And on that tour, I was able to promote my album, sell it at merch and all that kind of stuff. So that's, great. that's what I just wrapped up, finished right before Christmas. Um, so yeah, you know, I mean, right now it's I'm still in the lull of the new year, and things are starting to get. I'm getting, getting calls for this and that, but I have a feeling like road wise, unless something comes out of the blue, which it could, it could easily, you know, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. Otherwise, it's just mainly like session work. Well, that's awesome that you've checked the box as a as as a band leader. It's still on my to do list where I want to do like a I want to do like a polite. You can still clap your hands. Fusac record. I want to. I want to yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. And you have different guests yeah. on it and stuff. So that's kind of like. And I was like, I'll do my little record release party at the Big Potato and all that. And then you know, <laughs> COVID hits, and so it's still kind of like um, something on the to do list because you know my bread and butter is going out there. And um, 
playing, you know, giant backbeats for um, country yep. rock, a cu- country, a country yeah. rocker, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Definitely. Which is a great thing. I, and, I, I, and I, Oh no, no. I, I, I was just saying like, I, I, I love country rock. I, I wish more of the artists use percussion. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You, Cause da- yeah. Danny Reyes plays with Zach Brown. Um, yep. And yep. I'm trying to think of like the, at one point the Mavericks had a percussionist at one point, Tim McGraw had a percussionist, but you know, it's so easy just to put it all on Ableton now, which is like, yeah. wah, wah, wah. but um, yeah. I know that, I, you know, I know that da- uh, Danny has an amazing time with that band. He gets to shine and really play. It's a fun yeah. thing. Danny's great too. Yeah. yeah. No, so I'm assuming that you guys are all um, friends in the inner circle, the, the Lenny Castro's and the Louis Conte's and the Ron Powell's of the, I'm, I'm sure you guys, do you get together and break bread or honestly um I, they're all great and i and they've all when i first got to la welcomed me but i never see percussionists like most of the people i interact with are drummers or or other instrumentalists you know yeah. um just because like we're never on the same gig <laughs> for the yeah. most part unless it's a some situation where it's like a um you know a an award show where they need multiple percussionists or, or some, some film scoring session or something like that. But, and I would love to get into more of that actually, but uh, my interactions and most of my gigs I've done throughout my career, I've never seen another percussionist. So I'm friendly with them, but yeah, I don't get to really hang out. Unfortunately, yeah. with a lot of them. No, what no. I remember was going back a couple of years, but um, through the drummer, Mike Bennett, I don't know if you know, Mike Bennett, but yeah, good multi great multi-genre drummer in LA and he's taught at my camps and stuff and he said you need to come out to Ron Powell's house I guess he's got a crib and you know Rancho Cucamonga and he's got this detached like a like a pool house and in that pool house are all these stations so there's like a Brazilian station a Afro-Cuban station there's a drum set there's an electronic thing and he gets four guys and then you rotate to each station and then you jam and you take turns oh, soloing cool. and he does this apparently a lot and so he oh, just wow th- threw me on the deep end of the pool. And he, I was like, you know, I'm a drummer, right? I play percussion, but I don't have a great left hand slap. And he's like, and so he threw me on the Congress. He's like, yeah, you got to work on that left hand slap. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And Ron is so cool like, in that way. Like he's so like embracing and, and such a warm guy. I remember when I first got to LA, definitely like Ron and Kevin Ricard were like the two guys that were just like, and when Youngo Jackson, the, the three of them were really welcomed me, you know, and they're, it was it was an honor just because they're so established. You know, yeah, and, and Richie Gahate, like and then his knows. son is busy now. Yep. Um, Roland is very yeah. busy now. Yeah, yeah, Roland. Yeah, Roland's <laughs> kicking butt. Roland yeah. is definitely kicking butt. Yeah. So, um, and uh, yeah. did I notice that there were some film scores on the resume that you played on some film scores? Uh, yeah, it, they're kind of few and far between. Uh, yeah. you know, I think def it's kind of like to get into that scene is a, is a whole click unto itself. I would love to get into that scene, but, and I'll put that out there in the universe, but, um, yes, it's uh, out there. but yes, but I do have friends that, that are film scores and I have worked, worked on various soundtracks and, and scores and stuff like that over the years. That's and awesome. Documentaries and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah it's fun. It's- what else was I going to ask you? Oh, if this is, I try to ask everyone if there's some young buck, they're 21 years old, they're in middle America, but they want to move to one of the coasts and they want to do the thing and they want to do the music thing. What do you tell them? What do you tell them? One, especially in this day and age, is kind of like one, save your money if you really are wanting to move to one of the coasts and obviously get a game plan. But two, like do as much as you can up until then. Get, you know, I didn't have that luxury. I, I you know, there wasn't, I left Boston. I was doing a lot in Boston, but of what Boston could offer in the, in the mid nineties, you know? Yeah. So, uh, I made the move to LA saying, well, at the very worst, I could be doing what I'm doing in Boston, which is like playing in top 40 bands and wedding bands, whatever. So at least let me try to like get to LA and sustain myself doing that. And then trying to network as much as possible. Um, and, the ceiling of opportunity was so much higher, obviously, in LA compared to Boston. All that to say, though, that I didn't, there was no YouTube. There's no, like, I had digital presence. So it was like, I had to, like, hit the pavement. Now people can upload videos and, you know, you don't have to, like, hope to get to sit in on a jam session so somebody can hear you play. You automatically have that available to you. So I'll say, yeah, 
do as much groundwork as possible so that people can really check you out, check your vibe out, check your skills out and everything, even before you, you know, spend tons of money making the move. It, yeah. It may not be the right. You know? That's great advice. I, so, I, man, I remember hitting the pavement myself and saying yes to everything and doing all the schlepping and you're like, yeah. yeah, free demo session. Boom. Yeah. Wedding. Sure. No problem. Corporate party. Yeah. And you just do it with a yeah. smile on your face and, you know, you could be playing uh, an Ed Sheeran song at a wedding, and then the very next week you could be playing with Ed Sheeran. And if you're yeah. if you're if you're doing great work and you're a nice person, like it could totally happen. Yeah, and uh, and also it's like when you're playing and learning those songs to play in a in a top forty band or whatever, and learning the Ed Sheeran stuff. Learn the Ed Sheeran stuff. Learn it front back, all the inner stuff, the program percussion parts. If you're a drummer, just learn all the stuff so you know the song inside and out because you never know. You may get a call to play behind Ed Sheeran on a late night talk show all of a sudden, you know, and then yeah. boom, you know the song inside and out. Yeah. You know? And then just about learning the arrangement. And so because, you know, it's, it's such a huge compliment to walk in the door, a huge compliment to an artist where if you as a sideman walks in the door and you're fully prepared into their music and already know like, you know, oh uh, yeah, I know on the album you do the bridge this way, but you know, I see that you want to shorten it by two bars. Like it'll be like, oh yeah, you know, I, like other people may not notice that, you know? So yeah, it's like, just do your homework, you know? And, do your and, homework, exceed expectations, be a nice guy. I mean, you've checked every box, man. And that's why you've had the storied you. career <laughs> that you have, man. I mean, what a resume, really, really incredible. And do you have, um, Necessary an interest in uh, education. I mean, do people ever reach out to you and say, "Hey, can we do a Zoom lesson or something?" Or do, or do you uh, entertain that? Definitely. Oh, I I do that. You know, okay. I'm not quite uh, just being on and off the road. I don't do that many actual lessons, but I do uh, like a lot of talks, master classes, panel discussions. Especially Berkeley College of Music had me back a lot. Like. Pre-COVID, like I, at one point in time for a few years, I was there every semester in person for a week uh, wow. for a fall and spring semester. And then I have other uh, good friends that run percussion departments at various universities. And so I will, especially since COVID, I'll do like, you know, Zoom stuff where I'll do a master class. Yeah. Um, so I could do like hand percussion master classes for, for their like, you know, percussion majors or whatnot or or drum set majors that need to learn how to play hand percussion or classical percussions that need to learn how to play pop percussion because they'll have to play in a pops orchestra, even if they end up getting an orchestra gig or yeah. that kind of stuff. So I, I kind of, um, I'm definitely into education. And I'm definitely uh, am tailoring for various people's curriculums. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I think I'm going to be, um, I'm talking more to uh, University of North Texas because I was there with mm -hmm. like Carlock and all the guys and Blair Sinta and we all kind of were in school together doing that thing. And um, I'm so excited because now it was, it's really like a jazz program, you know, doing the bebop, doing the fusion, doing the big band. But now they've got like a whole music business program that I'm super excited about. And they're like, come talk to the kids and do a Zoom about how to cultivate your career and all that. So that's always fun. That's fantastic. That really is. That's great. Yeah. And so it's not always about just drumming, you know? Yeah. And in fact, most of 90% of the, of the music business is the business, right? So. Yeah. For sure. Well, <laughs> man, this has been an unbelievable conversation. What is the best way for people to find you with your dot coms and your socials and all that? Uh, yeah, I just launched a new website. It's actually taku.ninja, T-A-K-U dot N-I-N-J-A. That's so, awesome. So that's, that's, my, that's my site. And then, um, you know, I'm on all socials. So I'm at Taku Hirano on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, and um, you'll find me on YouTube and Facebook and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm out there. And then obviously like the new album, Blue York is on Spotify and Apple uh, and all, on all streaming platforms, title, um, Apple music. Yeah. I love the record. Who, who are the guys in, in your, I love the fact that, you know, you're a percussionist band leader. So you were hotter in the mix, which is yeah. like, it's like, Hey, this is my record guys. You're going <laughs> to, you're going to hear everything. Um, who, who are some of the guys in the band that night? Cause it was a, definitely yeah. a, a screenshot of a performance caught in time. Yeah. Uh, the drummer, so the drummer and the keyboards and I all were at Berkeley together. The drummer's name is Adrian Harpum. He's a producer, great drummer, but uh, and he's kind of become a producer of a lot of uh, kind of indie artists over the years. And he has um, the, the trust 
uh, of Ropa Dope Records. And so he has his own uh, boutique label under it. Awesome. And so, but fantastic drummer. And uh, the keyboardist, his name is Bruce Flowers. And Bruce uh, went way deep into jazz. And so like he was Betty Carter's final pianist. Uh, he was the keyboardist for Marcus Miller, for David Sanborn. And so the three of us used to play together all the time at Berkeley. So it, the, the impetus was us hanging out in New York City and going, you know, we need to play all that music that we love playing, like all that 70s Herbie Hancock and Miles Davis, Miles Electric Band stuff and George Duke, Billy Cobham, Funk Fusion. And like, we should just like do that sometime. And so after a while, it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take the bull by the horns. I'm going to, I'm going to book some dates for us. Let's pull a band together. And so that's how that started. And so they're fine with me kind of spearheading the project. Mm -hmm. So I ended up just being the Taku Hirano band. And so we started gigging, um, you know, uh, every few months in New York, whenever I wasn't on the road, I would book gigs and stuff. And so when I signed with Rope Dope under Adrian's label, um, the initial idea was for me to go in the studio and do a studio album, but then COVID hit. And I was like, well, I'm sitting on like a couple awesome nights, uh, you know, that we performed in New York. So let me go through all the material. So at the, at the top of COVID, I just started pouring through all the material and just listening to it. And then we compiled the best stuff and made it into, uh, uh, I think between two nights and we just made it into a live album. So I love it. And it's blue York yeah. B L U, right? No E. Yes. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. I really enjoyed that. Uh, I, the name, the name of the club is new blue and N U B L U. That's where we performed at, which is kind of underground jazz club. So hence the name blue York. So was it literally underground, like the comedy cellar? <laughs> it, it literally is actually. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Literally you walk in the door and you walk down a flight of stairs and it's, it's kind of a subterranean stage. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny. Yeah. I, I really, you know, I really enjoy New York and New Yorkers. I love visiting, but you know, if I had to choose a two, I would much rather um, have palm trees, you know? Yeah. I hear you. <laughs> you know, and I lived in New York for the last 10 years, actually. So I, I moved to LA uh, right after Berkeley. And then from 2010 to 2020, I lived in New York city. Yeah. So my wife's job transferred to New York. So I, I did a full decade plus there. And then once COVID hit and my wife's job went remote, and we're like, okay, let's let's move back to LA. So, okay. so all right, I, okay. I thought you were still living in New York. Um, what? So I ask every New Yorker um, this question: What's your version of the best pizza? Where, like, what cross street <laughs> is it? Oh man, that's tough. I mean, everyone's like, oh yeah, Prince Street Pizza or Joe's or whatever. Uh, I lived most of the most of my decade in New York. I lived in uh, Chelsea which uh, is a neighborhood um, on the west side of Manhattan in the 20s. And there is a really great place called Pizza Italia. It's, a, it's on 17th and 8th Avenue, and they have just fantastic grandma slice and also uh, just like a, um, a margarita slice. It's to die for. Nice. You know, slightly crunchy, but also chewy, great sauce. Yeah, yeah, that's my place. I usually go there. Yeah. I'm trying to remember the name of the place that we always go, um, but it's really kind of funny and tongue in cheek because all they serve is meatballs, and it's it's like it's like just meatballs, and all the waiters and oh, waitresses yeah. wear a shirt that says balls. It's hilarious. Yeah, yeah it's um, yeah, it's like the meatball. Uh, what's it called? There's one in there's one in Chelsea too. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I totally know what you're talking about. Because we always stay at the yeah. Dream Hotel right there in Times Square, and it's not you can kind of walk there. So we always go get yeah. our meatballs. And then I, always, I asked Aaron Comas, like, best donut and best uh, bagel, because he's just such a bagel and donut guy. I was like, if I lived in New York, I would be huge. All the carbs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, and then things being so expensive will help, will help temp that down, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. So it's, it is really expensive to live in, in on the coast. It has just gotten so yeah. ridiculous. Crazy. Yeah. Well, this has been a real pleasure. I hope everyone goes out and supports you and checks out blue york your uh your debut is that your debut as a band leader it is yeah That's yeah awesome. i'm pretty psyched yeah really Thank really great much. look for you on tour soon with uh hopefully fleetwood mac and okay. uh check out all your videos on the 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 net and uh yep. check out your new website which is one more time yeah. taku.ninja i love it <laughs> 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 thanks brother man this has been so fun all right i hope we get to Absolute meet in the flesh pleasure. at some point 
Yes, absolutely. I hope so. Yeah, let's let's grab grab a bite or a drink sometime. We'll keep in touch. It would be an incredible thing. And hey, to all you listeners out there, we really appreciate you. Be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. It always helps people find our podcast. As a matter of fact, this podcast was, it's actually in the top 1% of all the podcasts in the world. All right, we'll take it, man. So thank you guys for listening. Keep coming back for the good stuff. And we'll see you next time. Taku, thanks. All right, thank you. This has been the Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.